Hi, welcome to the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode three, Enlightenment and Happiness. Okay, now, during the last two episodes, we went through the various elements of, of enlightenment, and um, happiness is by far the most important element. All right, so this episode I'm going to devote to first, you know, talking about what happiness is, how we go about it, and then I'm going to like propose um, a method of becoming happier that it's, it's relatively unique. You don't see it um, promoted in psychology or in um, spiritual traditions. It's something I've been experimenting with for, for the last couple of years, and it seems really effective, really um, powerful. All right, so... So let's start with what is happiness. Happiness, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's basic. Happiness is just an emotion, you know. So basically what happens is, like, it's a feeling, you know, and so, like, if this feeling lasts for hours or days, then, you know, it becomes a mood, right? So we're in this happy mood. Now, if this, this you know, this mood tends to last for months or years, then it becomes a state of happiness. You know, like, some people are regularly happier than others of us, all right? So, you know, some people have, you know, a very strong happiness state. So, but it's, it's not anything more complicated than that. It's just basically enjoying um, having positive feelings, you know, not having negative feelings, and just basically being satisfied. It's like, you know, when, when they ask people to define happiness, when, when we say the word happiness, pretty much people know what we mean. So it's, it's, it's not any more complicated than that. And it's just based on our biology. We're, we're hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. I mean, all living organisms tend to do this, or at least organisms that have, um, um, you know, the capacity to feel sentient organisms. So we're just like that. So we seek pleasure and avoid pain. Okay. Um, now, here's why it's like the most important element in, um, in this path to enlightenment and in, in being enlightened. Basically, happiness is the only end in life, okay? It's the only, you know, everything else we do is a means to happiness. If we study, it's a means to happiness. If we work, it's a means to happiness. If we spend time with people, it's a means to happiness. If we work on goals, if we, you know, anything you can think of that we could possibly do that anybody has ever done, both as individuals and as a society, as a civilization, it's always to maintain or increase our personal or societal global level of happiness or to become happier, you know, or, or to, to reduce the, uh, the kinds of like negative emotions that limit our happiness. So, but it, it's always about happiness. You got you to gotta understand this. All right. Um, so, and um, so now we want to relate, you know, I think the next episode that I, uh, I'll do next week is going to be on goodness. Uh, because, like, I think, you know, if happiness is the more, most important element to enlightenment, goodness is, well, they're almost kind of like, um, almost synonymous, not really, but, like, goodness is really important also. It's like, basically, um, John Locke, British philosopher, he defined goodness as what creates happiness, okay? So that's why goodness is so important. If happiness is... The only thing we want, because it really is, you know, any, anything else we want, we want because it's going to help us be happier. If goodness is what creates happiness, you can understand how important goodness is. So in other words, like, you know, if, we, um, if we're going to be good to our friends, you know, that means well helping them become happier. If we're going to be good to ourselves, that means helping ourselves become happy, happier, okay? So, um, and that's why... Um, so along with that, you know, Aristotle, uh, about 2,500 years ago, I think, he, he, um, he had a bit of a different conception of happiness than we do, but, but he got this right in the sense that happiness is like the highest good. If, if goodness is the, um, you know, what, what creates happiness, happiness is also the highest good. I mean, there's a lot of, in other words, like, you can give something to someone, right? Um give them a car, give them a chair, give them, you know, anything, right? And that's good, right? But it's, it wouldn't be as good as if you gave them happiness, as if you helped them to become happier. 
uh, again with yourself. You could have anything and, and everything you want. You know, you could have absolutely everything you want. Um, it wouldn't equal happiness. Like, for example, if you had everything you wanted in the entire world, and, but you didn't have happiness, then all that everything would just like be meaningless. It would, there would be, you know, no reason for it. All right, so, and lastly, there's another guy, um, British guy, Jeremy Bentham. He's a utilitarian philosopher, I think back in the 1700s. Um, he said that the measure of goodness is what creates the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And we got to keep this in mind. In other words, sometimes it's not just being good, good to ourselves or good to just the people around us. You know, um, again, the greatest happiness for the greatest number to do things really good, you know, to be enlightened really is to be really good, not just to be good, to be really good. Um, to do things, to be really good is to try to help the most people, you know, experience the, the most happiness as possible. All right. Um, so, again, like, in, in line um, with happiness being, you know, the only thing we want, um, this isn't um, like a philosophical assertion. This is like, you know, they've, They've studied this, that basically um, they've asked people for, for decades, year by year by year, hundreds of thousands of people by now. They asked them, well, what do you want most from life? And the number one answer is always happiness. And this is not just here in the United States, it's across the world. Okay, and then, you know, they ask people, like they ask parents, well, what do you want most for your kids? Again, the number one answer is always happiness. So that's how important happiness is. And again, like this, this is like, you know, a, a series on enlightenment. Um, while happiness isn't, you know, the only aspect of, of, of enlightenment, certainly goodness and, and understanding reality the way it is, not being deluded by, by things, um, these other things are important. Happiness is by far the, the essential element of, of, of um, enlightenment. Okay. So... Uh, now, the average level here in the United States is about 70% and um, around the world, it's about 65%. So, like, you know, I mean, we, we could, you know, very easily become very, very happy, 90, 95%, uh, you know, close to 100% um, happy, 100, you know, whatever, it's, it's subjective, whatever. But um, we could... Um, do that for ourselves, become really, really happy, and that would be good. But enlightenment is a bit different in that, you know, enlightenment would, would actually not just focus on ourselves, on our own happiness, but to, to be more and more enlightened is to be happy, right? And then use that happiness, use that enlightenment to help the rest of the world become more enlightened and become happier. Okay, so like, you know, um, we, we can, you know, as a world, be much happier individually and societally, and that would help us to, to become more enlightened. And conversely, as we become more enlightened, as we become better people, as we, you know, um, understand truth or reality from, from illusion better, then, then we're, we're actually creating the conditions that are going to eventually result in, in much greater happiness for everyone. All right, now, now let's get to the, the methodology. Most people, and this is important, uh, most people like seek happiness indirectly, and they also seek it in, in ways that don't work very well. Um, there's a guy, uh, Dan Gilbert, um, compiled um, all the, the, the studies on this. He published a book called Stumbling on Happiness, where he presents it. And basically, the theme of that book is like most of us are not very good at predicting what's going to make us happier. So, for example, some people believe that, well, if they get their college degree, their bachelor's, they're going to be happier than just with a high school degree. And if they get their master's degree, they're going to be even happier. And if they get a PhD, they're even going to be happier. But no, according to the research, um, you know, college, um, high school grads are no less happy than PhDs. That same applies to intelligence. Uh, same applies to income. A lot of people like you know, spend a lot of time trying to make a lot of money. Now, all right, there's a caveat. Below the poverty line, income is very important to happiness. But, you know, once you get to the poverty line, it's like really, it's, it's marginally effective. So, um, 
So basically the idea is like, you know, so we have these ways of, of becoming happier that either don't work at all or work marginally and we invest so much time in it, they're indirect ways. Um, now some, some, some ways are actually very, very effective and very good and very wise. Um, the, you know, when, when researchers ask people, what's your number one means of happiness? Um, most people say, well, other people, you know, their, their, their spouse, their kids, their parents, their friends, you know, the people in their life, that's how most of us obtain our happiness. And, you know, you can't really argue with that. That's a really good way of, of you know, um, being happy, of sharing happiness. Um, but sometimes, you know, the, the problem with that is like, well, then, you know, your happiness is at the mercy of other people sometimes, or their happiness is at your mercy, you know. So it, it becomes, you know, ideally, it's good to go into relationships and to, to um, enjoy happiness in relationships, sharing your happiness with people rather than actively seeking happiness from them. You know, I've, I've been experiment recent, experimenting recently with this idea of, like, when I think of other people, and this is actually something I learned back when I was Orthodox Jewish in the 80s. There was like um, some rabbi or somebody said that like when you think of other people, you should think in terms of doing good to them. So like, so yeah, I've been experimenting with that. You know, when I'm thinking of other people, I'm thinking what good can I do for them and all, right? And so basically from that perspective, it helps you to not see other people as a means of happiness, which like, you know, fine, you're with them, you're going to be happy, but you won't create um, kind of like a sense of desire, or unfulfilled desire, let's say when they're not there or, you know, things like that. So, um, and it's, it's, I think it's just more moral. But anyway, so like almost everyone seeks happiness indirectly. Um, some of us do so by pursuing goals, by, um, you know, trying to get more education, more money, um, projects, you know, um, fame, um, achievements, accomplishments. And, and goals are, you know, it's not like these things don't work. You know, working toward a goal, whatever it is, even making money, whatever, if, you, if you're enjoying the process, it will work. But it's relatively indirect. Sometimes what you're working on doesn't work. So, all right. And another way of, um, popular way of, like, being really, really happy is, or <laughs> happy is um, gratitude. Basically this idea that to the extent that we're grateful for what's in our life, then we're focused on it, we're, we're appreciating it, and that's gonna like help us to become happier. Okay, and um, finally it's like something that, that also works, it's really good, but it's indirect. It's like doing what we love to do. If we love to sing, we should sing. If we love to do sports, we should do sports. Doing more of what we like to do. Sometimes, you know, um, like I, I happen to really enjoy being in Manhattan, in Manhattan, you know, New York City. I don't get in there as much as I'd like to, but, but you know, it works. But again, it's indirect. There's things that come in between us and doing sometimes what we want to do. All right, so the rest of the show, hopefully I'm going to like devote to a direct means of happiness that again, you know, I've kind of cultivated this, uh, experimented with this for the last two years. Um, it, you know, the only reference to it that I've seen has been like, there's a, a book, The Meditative Mind by a psychologist named Daniel Goleman. And he refers to about 40 different objects of meditation, because with meditation, like mindfulness meditation, you're always focused on something. Like you, be, you could be focused on your breath, or a mantra, or, or your feelings, or your thoughts. So like among these 40 different objects of meditation, you know, listed among them was, was joy, which is really the same as happiness. And so, like, you know, it's not like this isn't in the literature, you know, I, um, but I, I, that's the only reference to it that I've found. So, all right, here's the idea. The idea is, like, rather than seeking our happiness from indirect things, I'm going to do this, and then, like, if I'm lucky, I'm going to feel happier. You know, the, the idea is to feel happy for no other reason than it feels good and to do it as an act of will. In other words, like, um, let's say somebody was going to take a, a group photograph, and you're among a group of people, right? And so everybody's smiling for the photograph, right? I mean, people like to smile uh, for photographs. All right, what happens when they're like in the process, and let's say this photo photographer is going to take maybe 10, 15 photographs. 
you know, people will generally smile, you know, throughout this session, this photo session. And what they will experience is that um, as they're smiling, they're going to be intending to look naturally happy. Okay, it's kind of like they're going to be acting, you know, happier. They're going to be trying to, to, to look happy. And it works. I mean, like, while they're waiting to have their photo taken, while it's being taken, they're actually going to be feeling happier while they're smiling than before or after the photo was taken. Okay, this works. Now, so with smiling, it's very important. Uh, they've done a lot of research on this also. For example, they, they put a pencil in between people's teeth so they're not even intentionally trying to smile. And then they measure their, their level of happiness and find that, you know, when you put a pencil in between somebody's teeth, it activates the zygomatic muscles, the smile muscles, right? And that is a biological means requiring no intention to feel happier. All right, so like, so the first part of this, this method that I'm going to like present, you know, again, is this part of enlightenment to become happier, but a, a, a way of happiness that is direct, that is autonomous, that is dependent on you and not anything outside of yourself, and that you could also like get better and better at. So the, the first component of this is to smile, okay? Um, it's hard. It's hard. Um, you don't want to smile, I don't think, with, you know, baring your teeth, you know, very broad smile, because that's, you know, that's going to just appear too unusual, whatever. And, um, and sometimes I've, you know, I've been trying to do this for years. It, it's not all that easy. In other words, like, sometimes it's not really easy to, um, to smile when, when one is eating. And, um, and you know, it's, for me, it, it's hard to smile while I'm talking. I mean, you know, some people are really good at this. For example, salespeople, they train salespeople who just do telephone sales, who, who the other person never sees them. They train them to smile on the phone because another thing they've discovered is that the person on the other line, you know, can often know whether the person is smiling or not. They can tell the person's mood, you know, or whether they're smiling or not, you know, just, just by how they sound when, they, when people smile. All right, so that's the first, you know, step in this technique for happiness. Okay. Now, the next step is like, if you're just starting with this, you want to either like think back to your past and remember something that made you happy. You know, I don't know, some, some party. Uh, maybe if you're married, your, your wedding day, that's usually a really happy people um, event for women. Um, you won some kind of award, you, you achieved something, you know, anything like, so you think back in your past or you imagine something that you really want. Let's say you, you want to like um, buy a house, live in a house or something, or you want to kind of like achieve something. So you imagine yourself, you know, doing that. And so this, you know, recalling memories and imagining something in the future, it'll tap you into the feeling of happiness, all right? So you're smiling and you've tapped into the feeling through using, again, in the beginning, you're going to use like a memory or an imagination, imagining of the future. So, right, now what happens is, right, so now you're, 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 you're focused on the feeling, right? And so the, the third step is you want to separate that feeling of happiness because, again, happiness isn't, you know, like um, what makes us happy. In other words, like a lot of things, I could, you know, maybe I saw a movie um, last week that, that, that I that that helped me, that made me really happy, right? All right, but like, my experience of happiness isn't the movie. There's a, there's a separation. So in other words, like, so this, the, this third component is to, to realize that and focus just on the feeling of happiness, okay? So you're not going to, like, you're going to remove, you're going to not think about what made you happy, you know, something in the past or something in the future. You're just going to focus on the feeling of happiness, all right? So you're going to be smiling, okay? And you're smiling. And... Um, and then, then, all right, this is like this, I mean, happiness is just so simple. I mean, again, it's, 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 it's beyond bewildering why this, why this isn't our, our ordinary, commonplace way of being happy, because it just makes so much sense. It's like, the next thing you do, you just like, you maintain the effort. I mean, like, anybody who's gone to the, the gym, right, it works out. Let's say you're working with weights. If you want to lift... Um, weight more times or lift a heavier weight, you exert more effort. 
and, and it's the same thing with happiness. So like you want to basically, this is a practice in getting better and better at both feeling happy and maintaining the feeling, right? So like, so you're in touch with the feeling. And again, like my experience is like, I don't, I don't rely on, on memories in the past and imaginings in the future to evoke the happiness. After a while, you'll be able to do that automatically, right? You know, just because you want to, because it feels good. And so like what happens is then you just like, the effort is you want to make, you want to keep focused on that feeling. And this is like where meditation kind of like um, comes in. I've meditated for like 42 years. I started with transcendental meditation back in, I think it was 75, no, 74 maybe. Uh, and um, basically that was just like focusing on a sound. But meditation, all meditation is really focus. All right, so like basically you could be sitting in your living room, sitting anywhere, and what you would be doing is focusing on this feeling of happiness, okay? You know, you're, you're focused on the feeling and you're, you're essentially feeling happy. Now you gotta understand, these feelings, I should have gone into this before, they are visceral. They are throughout your body. And you know, most people feel happiness in the head area and in the chest. But you know, the happiness, they did, it, they did a map of the different emotions. And happiness was the one emotion that, you know, according to most people, they feel throughout their entire body. Okay, so you want to feel the happiness in your body. Okay, but you want to feel the feeling. And, and then, then there's two steps, two other steps. Basically, you know, by staying focused on it, you're feeling it moment by moment by moment. Now, like with any meditation, you're going to distract, be distracted. You're going to be thinking, oh, I got to go to the grocery store later. I got to do this, whatever. Your mind is constantly going to wander. You know, that, that happens to, to anybody who's been meditating for, for however long, okay? But when you notice that happening, you just pull your focus back to this feeling of happiness, all right? So basically, you're trying to get better at staying focused on happiness. And all right, it's very important also to remember that according to the science, according to psychology, we human beings can focus on more than one thing at a time. You know, it's kind of like we're driving a car and we're talking to somebody. Or, you know, we can do, you know, more than one thing. So, so the idea is like, you know, the idea is to ultimately incorporate this happiness practice into other things that you're doing. But again, like to get good at it, you want to do this, you know, kind of as like instead of like sitting down to watch TV, you could, you'd be sitting down to practice feeling happier, okay? So it's all right. It's like you're smiling, you're focusing on the feeling of happiness, you're focusing on it to, to, to maintain it, to lengthen it, to, to take it from moments to minutes to, you know, hours to, you know, you want to get good at calling it up and maintaining it at will. And the last step is like what we, you know, went through with, with the gym analogy. You want to kind of like, when you're there, you want to just strengthen it. You want to like, you know, uh, and part of this is like kind of like smiling. One, another piece of research that, that um, applies to this, there's, in psychology, there's such a thing as a Duchenne smile. Duchenne's smile is like, most people smile with their mouth, right? But some of us have a more complete smile that, that naturally incorporates our eyes. Our, our eyes kind of get like, you know, they're creased a little. You know, we, we kind of like, we smile with our eyes. So basically, you know, and that's kind of like, I think that's an example of, of it's a stronger smile. But, you know, the, the, the point of this is that, um, that basically you want to make the effort to feel happier and happier, to, to have a stronger feeling of this. Okay, and that's it. Okay, that's it. So like, actually, I got three more minutes, and I just want... So all right, so that's the happiness. Now, this is, this is important. I should, I should devote more time to this, but I, I will in future episodes. Basically, now then you got to deal with, all right, some things... This isn't a perfect world, and things that you would rather not happen are going to happen. So you've got to like have this happiness philosophy, and it's very, very simple. One, it's not necessary to feel, let's say, let's say anger, okay? Something happens, you know, and you, you think to yourself, well, you know, is it necessary that you become angry? It might be necessary for a moment, right? But it's really not necessary to maintain that anger. So you remind yourself, it's not necessary to feel anger, sadness, fear, Okay, it's really not necessary. A lot of people will experience the exact same thing you're experiencing without becoming angry or fearful or whatever. So, and 
then there's two other things. It's not helpful. I mean, like if something's happening and you become angry or sad or afraid or have some unpleasant reaction, it's not helping. If, if like if you're a parent and your kid is doing something and like, you know, and you become angry, you become less able to to get them to do what you want them to do or less able to parent them effectively. So um, and often it's not just that it's just like when we move to negative emotions, more often than not, it makes things worse. Because like as we get filled with this emotion, our mind isn't thinking as well because our emotions tend to cloud our reasoning. And then sometimes we express, let's say if it's anger, and then you know, we get involved in conflict. So again, usually these negative emotions make things worse. All right, we've got about a minute and a half left. So that's basically the negative, um, the, the philosophy of how to deal with negative emotions, and that's it. You know, so basically, by practicing smiling, direct happiness that doesn't rely on anything, but the realization that, that feeling happy feels much better than you know not feeling happy, and feeling happier <laughs> feels better than than feeling a little happy. So just realizing that and practic practicing that, and just this this simple philosophy how to deal because the, 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 the advantage of this philosophy is it deals with everything you know you could try to like resolve how to like you know get along with your you know your in-laws or your boss or something or there's a myriad of different kinds of things you could try to resolve but if you narrow it down to like just like you know negative emotions are just not necessary not helpful and they're often hurtful that that <laughs> allows you to just with one simple philosophy address anything that could possibly happen in your life. It's a, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic, um, that's the basic thing. All right, so like, this is happiness. Uh, I got about, you know, 15 seconds left. So next week, we're gonna focus on goodness. Because then goodness is what creates happiness, and it's also a very important uh, part of enlightenment. Thanks for watching, I'll see you again next week.